Maybachai and Maybachai housed the supreme command of the German armed forces, OK Gaulu, and the supreme command of the army, OK. On the surface, an outside observer could only notice an unremarkable one-story building with a ridge tile roof. In constructing the underground shelters, every effort was made to avoid disturbing the upper forest area. Thanks, apparently, such precautions Allied bombers overlooked these two important command centers. In October I reported to my new duty station at OK. The offices of the Chief of General Staff and his closest aides were in Building No. 5 of Maybach II, and the Operations Directorate was in Building No. 6. Building No. 3 housed a special analytical department, Foreign Forces, East. The Chief of the General Staff at that time was Colonel General Guderian, and the head of the Military Intelligence and Analysis Directorate was General Reinhard Gellin, while the Operations Directorate was headed by General Wank. Gellin's service was engaged in processing all information coming through military intelligence channels and other sources from the Eastern Front and necessary for military planning, determining tactical tasks and strategic goals, as well as the order of their achievement. The methods of work of the Directorate could be compared to the painstaking addition of a rather intricate and confusing mosaic. Hundreds of reports received from agents in the process of interrogating prisoners of war and defectors, from sabotage groups thrown behind the front line, as a result of intercepting radio transmissions and telephone conversations, air and ground reconnaissance, studying statements of civilians and documents of killed enemy soldiers, all this created a general picture of the military situation, allowing to assess the opposing forces of the Russians, to prepare combat operations, and make important decisions. Each individual report was subjected to a comprehensive, careful analysis, compared with information from other diverse sources, and then with almost pedantic attention to the smallest detail was placed in its proper place in the mosaic, reflecting the real state of affairs on each particular section of the stretched front. Many years of meticulous work devoted Gelin to the study of the Soviet armed forces. He compiled the most detailed dossiers on the combat power and personnel of various military units of the Russians, down to the divisional, and in some cases to the regimental level. He knew the supply of special units with vehicles, tanks, and other equipment. In addition, he collected unique information about the military-industrial potential of Soviet Russia, the amount of material aid from the Allies, and the morale of the enemy troops. There was even a special book, which we call the Red Bible, containing the most intimate characterizations on Russian leading military and political figures and directors of major industrial enterprises. After the final categorization of all the available information, other members of the general staff would get down to business. It was necessary to carefully examine and revise the results obtained to determine the probable goals and objectives of the two opposing sides, then transfer these conclusions to the operations directorate for use as source material for operational planning. Our data regarding the exact timing of the planned Russian offensive, the concentration of enemy troops and the direction of the main strikes, of course, served as a basis for Hitler as commander-in-chief of the German Armed Forces' strategic decisions. After reporting for duty at the General Staff, I was told that I must report to General Reinhard Gellin. The General immediately made a lasting impression on me. He was strikingly different from those Wehrmacht cadre servicemen with whom I usually had to deal at the front. Well-groomed, trim, with a massive forehead testifying to a high intelligence, he looked more like a professor who had accidentally put on a military uniform than an officer who had been fighting for five years. And his manner of speaking matched his appearance. Galen never said unnecessary words. His speech was always balanced and cultured, and his questions were short and clear. In conversation, he avoided vague expressions. In an argument, he avoided ambiguous arguments. My introductory conversation with Galen seemed to satisfy him. At the end of it, he led me into the room where the daily meetings were held. Here were spread out large staff maps, scrawled with blue lines and marked in red ink. Until then, I had never had to deal with military intelligence, and I was completely unfamiliar with its methods. And now, 
I saw the war from a completely different angle. Up to that moment I had seen maps showing the positions of battalions, regiments, or at most divisions, but now I saw maps showing the position of troops on the entire Eastern Front. Gellin must have noticed my slight embarrassment, because he gave me a few minutes to gather my thoughts before he began to explain the general front situation. What was new to me was that Gellin, without dwelling on the location of German troops, without touching on the number of personnel and material resources at the disposal of the OKDA, spoke directly about the positions occupied by Russian divisions, their naval and air forces. He then acquainted me with his own conclusions, made taking into account the configuration of the front line, the nature of the movement of Soviet military units, and places of concentration of large tank formations. In the southern section of the front, acting against the German army group south, the Russians, according to Jelen, were increasing the pressure on Budapest, moving in a northwesterly direction and approaching the borders of Austria, further to the east and northeast, high in the mountains and on the northern spurs of the Carpathians, the Russians were fighting local battles with the 8th German Panzer Army, 1st German Panzer Army and 1st Hungarian Army, which occupied an advantageous position. From the rear they were covered by the steep slopes of the Carpathian mountain range. Anticipating the difficulties awaiting them in this area, the Russians concentrated their main forces on the 2nd and 3rd Ukrainian fronts, where they encountered certain complications. Then Gelin turned to the situation on the frontier between the Carpathians and Warsaw. In the course of a powerful offensive, which allowed the Russians to pass from Modula through Minsk and Brest-Litovsk to the walls of Warsaw, and which ended in an even greater disaster for Germany than the Battle of Stalingrad, the enemy managed to seize and firmly hold three bridgeheads on the west bank of the Vistula. It was these bridgeheads, located in the area of the towns of Warka, Pulawa and Baranau, 60200, kilometers south of Warsaw, that Gelen paid special attention to. Then he emphasized that the actions of the 1st Ukrainian and 1st Belarusian fronts went far beyond the usual tactical maneuver and acquired the scope of a general battle. Gelen touched upon the situation in other parts of the Eastern Front and noticing some of my confusion at what I heard added. I am afraid that this is the way events are developing now. At the end of my first lesson, Lieutenant Wessel, who was in charge of staffing issues at Gellin, introduced me to my new colleagues and showed me the sector of the Eastern Front for which I was to be responsible. It was about the section between the Carpathians and the confluence of the narrow river into the Vistula, where the Russians had captured three bridgeheads near the towns of Warka, Puloi, and Baranau. In this strip of the enemy's offensive, the defense was held by Army Group Center consisting of the 9th and 17th General Army and 4th Tank Army. What I saw and heard that day at the main command post of the ground forces kept me awake until almost dawn. For all the years at the front I never lost my presence of mind, I always knew how to act and what to do in the most seemingly hopeless situation, because in a fierce battle all my attention. All my energy was always focused on one thing, how to defeat the enemy and not to die myself. But my current situation was different. I was no longer a direct and active participant in the events, but only a passive observer. And it was very, very difficult to get used to this new situation for me, not without reason I had to go through an attack of the deepest, but fortunately, short-term depression. For the next few days, until I was officially confirmed in my position. I attended internal meetings, listened to reports on the situation at the fronts, and familiarized myself with my new duties. Gellin once again invited me to his office and, talking to me, outlined in detail the potential striking power of the Russians, scrupulously enumerated the armed formations and material resources at our disposal. At the same time, he again dwelt on the importance of the three previously mentioned Russian bridgeheads on the Vistula, predicting that the fate of the entire Eastern Front would certainly be decided in these strategic areas during the winter campaign. According to information received by his office, the Russians, having seized the bridgeheads, did not waste time. They immediately moved here solid reinforcements and created a solid defense.
All our attempts to eliminate the bridgeheads failed mainly because we acted insufficiently persistent and too small forces. The Russians even managed, after months of summer offensive, to improve their positions in some places and to expand the territories of the bridgeheads. In June, the Allied forces landed in Normandy, and in the battles that unfolded their German troops suffered serious losses. This forced the Wehrmacht High Command to transfer to the newly opened theater of operations additional military units, especially elite tank divisions. Stalin's constant demands for the opening of a second front forced the German command to keep in France significant forces, which were just not enough to throw the Russians behind the Vistula and create on this river insurmountable barrier wall. Impressive and temperamental description of the situation on the Eastern Front by Gellin reflected the depth of internal conflict, perhaps even tragedy, experienced by him, the head of the military intelligence and analytical department. Day after day he devoted all his energy to intelligence work against the Russians, although he was well aware of Hitler's dismissive and distrustful attitude to his information and his unwillingness to listen to the conclusions and recommendations of his department. Gellin did not belong to the loyal supporters of Hitler, rather the opposite, but as a soldier, he did his duty, and sparing no effort or time, organized intelligence activities against the Russians. The daily work of departments of the general staff was regulated by the order of meetings in Hitler's headquarters, where representatives of all three branches of the troops reported to the Fuhrer about the situation in the area of their attention. For the ground troops usually reported General Guderian. Preparing for the speech at Hitler, he held with the relevant members of the general staff his own meeting, which received the latest information about the latest developments on the fronts. Otto allowed him not only to effectively manage his subordinate departments, but also to competently make well-reasoned suggestions to Hitler. That morning, which will be discussed, the meeting with the Fuhrer was scheduled for 11 o'clock, and therefore we gathered at Gellin's place at 10 o'clock. In order to be in time with our calculations, we came to work at 7 o'clock sharp. It was necessary to review the reports of the headquarters of Army Group Center about the actions of the opposing sides during the past night, to put on maps the latest information about the location and movement of the Red Army units and other important details. In addition, it was necessary to consult with some departments of the Air Force and to obtain the necessary information from other military and civilian organizations and institutions. At the front, intelligence information was extracted in various ways, sent to the rear of the enemy small groups of specially trained fighters, organized reconnaissance by combat, even listened to the characteristic noises in the enemy's line of action, trying to determine their origin. In addition, prisoners of war and defectors were thoroughly interrogated, Conversations with civilians were held, radio transmissions and telephone conversations of the enemy were monitored, either directly or by parallel inclusion. Special planes dropped agents from the Brandenburg Division or special training centers into the enemy's rear to carry out special tasks, but they had to return on foot across the front line. Various channels also received information about the transportation of manpower and equipment by rail and about the output of military products by industrial enterprises. The front aviation supplied us with aerial photographs of the Russian front line of defense and the territory immediately adjacent to it. These photographs recorded the routes of movement and places of concentration of enemy military units, bridges and roads, existing and under construction, airfields, stationary and field, artillery positions, and many other useful things. All these disparate parts of a complex and colorful puzzle we had to put together, inserting piece by piece to get a coherent and clear picture of the real situation at the moment. On the basis of the information obtained in this way, the Gellin Directorate always managed to learn in advance and warn the leading organs of the Wehrmacht and the state about the preparation of a small magnitude major operation of the Russians. Hitler, however, constantly and stubbornly denied the reliability of such methods of gathering information.
although in most cases with the conclusions of Gellin agreed with high-ranking and honored military officers who had received excellent training at the general staff courses and are well aware that without well-established intelligence is impossible to successfully wage war. Hitler imagined himself a great strategist, and the initial easy successes allowed him to strengthen the belief in his own military genius. He could not accept the idea that some circumstances can affect his unrivaled talent to lead large-scale military campaigns. This was one of the reasons for our serious failures on the fronts and crushing defeat in the East. In periods of rapid Russian offensives to the share of management Gellin fell especially much work. In addition to the morning meeting, there was also an evening meeting, and we were always ready at any moment to provide the required information. This meant that we had to work until late in the evening, but even after that there was always something urgent to be done, so it was not uncommon for me to be at my desk in the early morning. I was completely dependent on the telephone, and if during a major offensive the telephone line was overloaded, blocked, or destroyed, the situation became critical, especially during the day. Front units were usually in constant motion and often did not have time to prepare and forward regular reports, and I had to find other, alternative sources of information willy-nilly. There was less difficulty at night. As a rule, we did not rely much on dry reports, with only bare figures and facts that for some reason did not inspire confidence. In such cases we usually endeavored to verify the information by personal conversations by telephone, and having obtained a fuller picture of what was happening at the front, to be better prepared for the morning meeting with the fewer. In October, November, and December 1944, the three named Vistula bridgeheads appeared most frequently in my work plans. The flow of written reports from these areas increased daily. While Hitler was forming two new armies, staffed with the best officers and supported by the most capable tank divisions, in the hope that this would help to radically change the situation in our favor, the Russians concentrated on the Eastern Front unprecedented in size and power strike forces. By the beginning of November we already had a fairly accurate idea of the human and logistical resources of the Russians, of the places of their predominant concentration, of tactical plans and strategic designs. Observations of the movement of Soviet military units in the area of the Barino Bridgehead and on the adjacent territory of the eastern bank of the Vistula River convinced us that it was from here that Marshal Konev, commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, intended to invade the Upper Silesian Industrial Basin. At the Vistula Bridgeheads near Warka and Pula, Marshal Zhukov gathered the most combat-ready units of the 1st Belarusian Front which justly earned a glorious reputation, clearly aiming at Berlin, the capital of the Third Reich. These two fronts, occupying a defensive frontier of 200 kilometers from Warsaw to the main bend of the Vistula, a post-army group center, thoroughly shattered during the summer offensive of the Russians, although strengthened by the 4th and 9th Panzer Divisions. Reports from the areas of these three bridgeheads in the first half of November 1944 convinced us that the Russian preparations for the offensive were far from complete and that they continued to replenish personnel, accumulate and renew equipment, and bring ammunition. In the reports of German commanders constantly mentioned the numbers and locations of completely new infantry formations, tank divisions, artillery units, and air squadrons of the enemy. We received quite reliable information about their movements from deserters, whose numbers were unusually large, and from civilians who had made their way from Russian-occupied territories to the German side. The incoming information indicated such an unprecedented, unbelievable concentration of Russian military power that it was decided to use all available channels and means that could confirm the truth of such reports or reasonably refute them. The intensive reconnaissance measures carried out during two weeks did not give us the slightest reason to doubt the plausibility of the previously received information. On the contrary, we received more and more material every day to convince us of the correctness of our initial conclusions. As for me, I could no longer cope with the increased flow of information during the daytime hours and therefore had to work most of the night. Almost always at midnight, Galen appeared in our office with a pot of coffee, helping us with our current assignment with good advice and deeds.
Sometimes he personally called to the phone familiar to him commanders of units opposing the zones of concentration of Soviet troops. Seeing Gelin's sincere benevolence, his constant desire to help in moments of extreme tension, I was imbued with a feeling of deep sympathy for this man. Once in late November or early December, Jelen, talking to me at night, said that according to air reconnaissance and reports of trusted agents, the Russians have pulled up east of the Vistula significant forces and prepared to transfer them to the known to the reader already Vistula bridgeheads. For the first time was named the expected date of the Russian offensive, January 10 to 15. At the same time, said Gelin, it is very likely that the Russians are deliberately trying to mislead us and themselves attack in December. In view, they say, the haste of concentration of Soviet troops in the territories adjacent to the bridgeheads, such a development of events can be expected. Helen also mentioned another possibility. He said that it was possible that the Russians simply wanted to accumulate human and material resources at the bridgeheads in order to avoid difficulties with transportation, if the Vistula opens too early and the ice drift begins. I need any information, no matter how insignificant it may seem, said Galen. Only then I will be able to determine the date of the beginning of the Russian offensive more or less accurately. Knowing it, we can add this detail to our report on the total number of Russian manpower and equipment on this section of the front and try to convince Hitler in the need to allocate additional reserves, especially tanks and artillery to strengthen Army Group Center. Otherwise, a terrible catastrophe awaits us here. You have no idea how terrible. Army Group Center has too few troops on the front line and only one division in reserve. Hitler was already well aware of the situation in the area. He was regularly informed by General Guderian, who highly valued the knowledge and experience of Gelen, and Gelen himself constantly reported to the Fuhrer, orally, and in writing. However, despite all the alarming facts and irrefutable evidence, Hitler refused to transfer to Army Group Center to strengthen the defense of at least a few infantry divisions, and sent all reserve army units, tank formations, and material resources to the Western Front. On December 14, 1944, Hitler launched his last major offensive in the Ardennes. The young officers, myself included, spent the first few days under the impression of our successes. Gelen, on the other hand, did not really share our optimism. Once in a conversation on Christmas Eve, he said, by the way, what's the point of all this? Fighting in the West, Armored divisions are desperately needed on the Vistula to protect Silesia, Pomerania, West and East Prussia, and perhaps Berlin from Russian attacks. Information from mid-December confirmed that the Russian offensive should not be expected before January 12 to 15. Between Christmas and New Year's Eve, Gelen again specifically engaged in my area of work. Together, we outlined additional operations to collect intelligence information on the most dangerous areas and began to put our plans into practice. Guderian, wanting to once again try to convince Hitler, began to seek an extraordinary audience with him. Finally, on December 31 was scheduled for a meeting, to which Guderian intended to take with him and Gelen. Knowing how difficult it would be to convince Hitler to do something on the Eastern Front on the basis of information received military intelligence, Gelen decided to apply some psychological method, unaccustomed to the leading employee of the general staff. We once again double-checked the data on the concentration of Soviet armies on the east bank of the Vistula, near the three notorious bridgeheads. Gelen requested in the operational directorate of the OKDAG the latest information regarding the number of our troops in the threatened areas. Following Gelen's instructions, I prepared a map to show Hitler. On it, I graphically depicted the opposing military forces, emphasizing the significant superiority of the Russians in infantry, tanks, artillery, aircraft, and logistics. For this purpose, I drew on the map in red ink a large schematic figure of the Soviet soldier, the same silhouettes of a tank and an ammunition depot and contrasted the same symbols, but considerably inferior in size and executed in blue ink. Next to each conventional figure, red or blue, he put specific figures reflecting the quantitative content of the information. In this way, we tried to ward off possible accusations of a superficial approach 
or the desire to optically influence the Fuhrer. The map clearly showed that the enemy outnumbered us in manpower by a factor of 10, and in tanks and material support disproportion in favor of the Russians was even more noticeable. Meeting and conversation with the Fuhrer turned out to be a crushing defeat for all staff associated with the service of Gellin. Hitler did not show the slightest interest in our information. Only yielding to the persistent requests of Guderian, he ordered an additional allocation of Army Group Center to rifle companies as a mobile reserve. Gehlen returned from Hitler in an even more depressed state. The Fuhrer did not even bother to look at the specially prepared for him intelligence material and, making a decision, did not consider it necessary to take into account the information contained therein. The fate of the German front from the Carpathians to East Prussia was thus finally predetermined. January 1. Gellin invited the officers of the department in his office for a glass of schnapps. Whether he wanted to celebrate his long overdue promotion, or simply to mask the feeling of depression after an unsuccessful audience with Hitler, or perhaps, in this way to express to his subordinates his appreciation for the diligent work, it is difficult to say. In proclaiming a toast in honor of the new year, Gellin got carried away and spoke at length about the military and political developments of the past twelve months, and at the end he outlined, in very general terms, his own vision of the changes that awaited us in the new year. In his opinion, the war in the East will end in April or, at the very least, in May 1945, because the Russians are now much stronger than we are, both militarily and economically, and Germany's position is steadily deteriorating. Fighting on two fronts, we are unable to resist the pressure of the Russians for long. Our resources by all accounts are rapidly depleting. The German people are tired and have lost faith in victory. Mole, the huge economic potential of the Western Allies, their superiority in the air, and the availability of virtually unlimited reserves in manpower and equipment, leave us in the West even less hope for success than even in the East. Gellin did not hide from us that, as he believes, to continue to fight with the Western Allies no longer makes sense, and therefore, in his opinion, it is necessary. Regardless of the consequences, it is necessary to remove all without a trace of German troops from the Western Front and send them to fight the advancing Russian hordes. The main goal, to prevent the Red Army to move further west, deep into Central Europe. He also touched on the upcoming Yalta Conference, at which, they say, the Allies will decide the fate of Germany and its people. When Jelen finished, the room was silent for a while. After such a conversation lost all desire to have fun, and we silently parted, each immersed in his own unhappy thoughts. The information received in the first days of January 1945 confirmed the assumptions made earlier by Gellin concerning the timing of the offensive in the East. The Russians had concentrated an unprecedented number of troops and equipment on the Vistula bridgeheads. The actual numbers far exceeded our preliminary estimates and surpassed anything we had previously encountered during the war. The situation became so threatening that the High Command ordered the withdrawal of General von Sacken's tank corps, sent in January to reinforce Army Group Center, away from the front line, so that it would not suffer from the heavy Russian artillery fire that usually preceded a major breakthrough. The command, moreover, hoped as a result of this decision to keep the tank corps in a permanent combat reserve and engage it immediately wherever there would be an urgent need. However, Hitler, having learned of this order, ordered the tanks to be left three to six kilometers from the front line. As a result, they were within range of Russian artillery fire. No reasonable explanations for the reasons for cancelling the order of the Supreme Command Hitler did not deign to present, and there was no time to correct the mistake. The Russian offensive was about to begin. On January 12, Marshal Konev's troops rushed deep into Germany from the Baranuva, Sandomir bridgehead. On January 13, troops led by Marshal Zhukov went on the offensive from the Pulaski and Warki bridgeheads. General von Sacken's tank corps, which was in reserve, suffered significant losses during the Russian artillery preparation, which lasted for hours, clearing the way for the infantry to attack. The Soviets, advancing westward,
swept away everything in their path. Like raging torrents of water breaking through a dam, they crushed German positions along the entire front. By passing German military units that were in the Russian rear like islands in a stormy ocean, the Russians had the only goal, to break into Germany as soon as possible. In these anxious days, all employees of the intelligence analytical department worked day and night, tirelessly, to the point of exhaustion. Galen shared with us all the hardships and hardships. But it was too late. Military intelligence could not help the German command. The front in the offensive strip of the Russians collapsed. Command posts were destroyed. Communication officers were captured or wandered somewhere, trying to get away from danger and make their way to their own. The situation at the front was changing so rapidly and radically that we lost all contact with the fighting German units and had not the slightest idea of the real events. Large military formations, with which we have always maintained a steady connection, constantly disappeared somewhere, as if disappeared from the face of the earth. In the end, Hitler ordered the sending of significant reinforcements by rail to the battle area, but when these troops arrived at their destination, they found that they were already in the rear of the Russians. On the fifth or sixth day of the offensive Conives, advanced detachments reached the upper Silesian industrial basin, and on the tenth day they reached the Oder near the town of Kloga. In connection with my appointment as assistant to General Guderian, I left the command of Gelen on January 20. As the last favor I rendered to Gelen, I transported his family from Saxony to Bavaria. The general already knew. According to the decision of the Yalta Conference, Saxony was to be included in the zone of Soviet occupation of Germany after the war. But even after leaving the Intelligence Analytical Directorate, I met with Gelen at working meetings in Guderian's office almost daily until Hitler removed them both from their posts and abolished the service of Gelen. One day, as I was reminiscing about the happy days of the not-too-distant past, my thoughts were disturbed by Guderian announcing the upcoming second meeting with Hitler. Shortly after midnight in a rainy and cold February, we left Zossen for Berlin. The distant horizon was illuminated by the glow of the fires. No one uttered a word. All were silently immersed in unhappy thoughts, especially Guderian. Soon, we turned off the Hermann Göring Strasse onto the narrow road leading to the Führer's hideout. This night, the security measures were even more stringent. At every corner stood sentries with automatic rifles and hand grenades at their belts. One of them escorted us from the parking lot to the entrance of the shelter and handed us over to another guard. Construction of this underground shelter began in the courtyard of the Imperial Chancellery only in 1944, when the basement directly beneath the Chancellery building was deemed unreliable and did not provide complete security for the Fuhrer and his closest associates. The construction was carried out in great haste and was never completed. We descended what seemed like endless steps between bare and cold concrete walls. At the bottom we were met by the same SS officer who had checked our papers at noon. We surrendered our personal weapons again and stood, trying to keep a casual and contented appearance under the stairs of the train guards. We were then allowed into the reception area, where Kalten Brunner graciously greeted Guderian and informed us that Hitler had secluded himself with Bormann. A few minutes later, Bormann appeared in the doorway and invited Kaltenbrunner to proceed to Hitler's office. Observing Kaltenbrunner, I tried to discover the reason for my acute dislike of this man. Perhaps his appearance played a part in this. The rough features of his face indicated cruelty, and if it were not for the dueling scar indicating his student past, anyone would say that he looked more like a loader. Nearly two meters tall, broad-shouldered, with shovel-shaped arms, he possessed considerable physical strength, and I trembled every time he shook my hand. An Austrian by birth, Kaltenbrenner made a dizzying career out of his political fanaticism, ruthless cruelty, and penchant for intrigue. At the time being described, Kaltenbrenner was head of the powerful General Directorate for Imperial Security, RSHA, which brought together both the criminal and political police, or Gestapo, under its umbrella. His rise to power began after the assassination attempt on Reinhard Heydrich.
Between Hitler's rise to power and the outbreak of World War II, SS Obergruppen für Heydrich, Reichsführer Himmler's deputy, was able to completely rest his own chief on his influence. At the same time, it was no secret that Himmler always did what Heydrich wanted or recommended. But in the early years of the war, some people from Himmler's entourage and primarily Walter Schellenberg and Otto Ohlendorf managed to some extent to discredit Heydrich in the eyes of Himmler to reduce his influence. However, Heydrich was able to gain the support of the Fuhrer himself, who even appointed him Imperial Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, where he was killed by Czech resistance fighters in 1942. When Himmler needed to select a candidate for the vacant post of Chief of the RSHA, he was reluctant to nominate anyone from his own staff, fearing a repeat of Heydrich, who over time had become a dangerous rival in the struggle for power. So Himmler's choice fell on Kaltenbrunner, then head of the SS, and the police of Upper and Lower Austria. At first, Kaltenbrunner showed extreme caution and tried to appear obedient tool Himmler. Then gradually he began to weave intrigue, skillfully using for their own purposes the mutual dislike of Goebbels, Himmler, and Bormann, constantly fighting among themselves for the favor of Hitler. Previously, this group was adjoined and goring, but his prestige was so undermined by serious failures in the actions of the Air Force that he was no longer able to compete with the trio on an equal footing. Each of the three rivals continuously plotting to sully the other two in front of the Fuhrer. Therefore, Bormann considered Himmler's appointment in 1944 as commander of the army group a serious threat to his position in the party hierarchy and began to openly build up his own military power. Bormann decided to counteract Himmler's growing influence by using Kaltenbrunner, whom he began to gradually and stealthily bring into the circle of Hitler's closest confidence. The realization of his plan favored the fact that Himmler had to spend a lot of time in the troops, confirming his competence as commander of a large army unit. Kaltenbrunner's authority with Hitler had already risen so high that the Fuhrer gave orders directly to him through Himmler's head. My thoughts and memories were interrupted by the joint appearance of Hitler, Bormann, and Kaltenbrunner. After briefly exchanging greetings, we all made our way to the briefing room, a small, rather empty room with gray painted walls, with a bench against one of them, a large card table, and a single chair. There were few people present, and Hitler immediately asked Guderian to report on the situation in the East. Chief of General Staff decided to take advantage of a rare opportunity and once again try to convince the Fuhrer in the feasibility of a plan to hold back the advance of the Russians. Speaking firmly and decisively, he began with the main topic the looming threat to Berlin. He emphasized that on the fate of Berlin depends on whether Germany will stand or be defeated, insisted on the need to deflect the threat, to buy time, and allow millions of Germans from the eastern territories to escape the advancing Red Army, not sparing the civilian population. After a brief pause, Hitler asked in a cold, impassive tone about the strength of the Russian advanced units advancing toward Berlin. As reported by General Gellin, the Russian personnel outnumbered the German troops by a factor of five. In tanks, artillery and ammunition supply, the ratio was even more unfavorable to the German side. Reporting, Gellin began to lay out the maps, but Hitler stopped him impatient hand movement. At this point, Guderian made his proposal concerning a flank attack from Pomerania, which was part of the overall plan to avert disaster. To do this, according to Guderian, should be implemented the following measures. Withdraw from Courland in Germany, two encircled armies, to gather in a fist all available in the Third Reich and in Italy military reserves, and urgently transfer them to Pomerania, to send there, too, the 6th SS Panzer Army under the command of Joseph Dietrich, the most capable tank unit of Germany, although it weakens the German position in the West. With these 30 to 40 divisions and one and a half thousand tanks, Guderian intended to strike from Pomerania in a southerly direction and from the area of Gloga in a northeastern direction, hoping in this way to withdraw the immediate threat to Berlin and create a powerful defensive line on the line of fortifications along the old German-Polish border, 
which form the basis of the so-called Tersh-Tigelskogo rampart. It is necessary, they say, to put everything on this last and only card. Eudirian had already spoken with passionate conviction, ignoring the disapproving gestures of the Fuhrer, expressing his disagreement with the arguments of the chief of the general staff of the army. Eudirian supported his arguments with diagrams, charts, calculations, numbers, prepared by the staff of the office of Gellin on the basis of data obtained from the processing of intelligence reports, interviews with prisoners of war and defectors, as well as means of aerial reconnaissance. Clenched palms and staring dully at the maps, charts and diagrams spread out before him, Hitler continued to remain silent. Eudirian simply already exhausted. He looked at the Fuhrer, expecting at least some reaction, but in vain. The silence dragged on and became agonizing. The silence was broken only by the muffled explosions of aerial bombs. Holding my breath, I waited for the decision of the fate of the population of the eastern German territories. Hitler slowly rose, made, limping, a few steps, staring unseeing eyes in space. Then he suddenly stopped and coldly said goodbye to us, without expressing his attitude to the proposals Guderian just heard. With Hitler remained Bormann, the lot had been cast. In making his decision, Hitler ignored the suggestions of his general staff. In fact, the degree of his confidence in the general's recommendations was so low that he removed Guderian as chief of the general staff on March 6, 1945, and reduced Gellin's intelligence and analysis directorate to the size of a small group incapable of effectively doing any useful work. 22 divisions of the 16th and 18th armies, awaiting their fate, continued to trample in Courland, completely cut off from land communication with Germany. The most capable 6th SS Panzer Army and several other divisions, withdrawn from the Western Front and withdrawn from Italy, were transferred to Hungary rather than to Pomerania, where German troops could hardly contain the far superior enemy forces. As a result, 1,000, 200 tanks were concentrated in the area between Lake Balaton and Budapest for the planned German offensive, which had no meaning or significance in view of the mortal threat looming over Berlin. In addition to the 6th Panzer Army and 6th Panzer Army, together forming Army Group Balkans, under the command of General Dietrich, there was also a cavalry regiment and parts of the 3rd Hungarian Army. Hitler intended to strike in the southern and eastern directions to return the territories from the city of Pex to the confluence of the Drava and the Danube, again include Budapest in the general German line of defense, and turn the Danube all the way to the confluence with the Drava in the backbone of the German defense rampart in Hungary. Meanwhile, in Pomerania from the German side in the offensive involved seriously exsanguinated 3rd Panzer Army, some units of the 11th Panzer Army, and no more than 500 tanks. But Guderian did not want to surrender. Even in the early days of March, he was still trying, using carefully calibrated calculations service Gillen, concerning quantitative estimates and the disposition of enemy forces to induce Hitler to abandon his plans in the South. All these efforts only contributed to the fact that both they and Guderian and Gellin increasingly fell into disfavor with Hitler. There was such a case. Gellin, during the next report to Hitler, again presented absolutely reliable information, prepared by experts of the highest level, regarding the strategic plans of the Soviet command and the places of concentration of Russian striking units. After listening, Hitler, in the strongest irritation, and in a tone that allows no objections, said, I categorically reject these worthless proposals. Only a true genius is able to foresee the intentions of the enemy and make the necessary conclusions, and no genius will not pay attention to various trifles. Relations deteriorated to such an extent that whenever Guderian or Gellin mentioned any failure or unpleasant fact, Hitler accused them of one-sided and biased coverage of events, while he liked to repeat that, planning military operations is guided invariably by his own intuition and inherent inspiration, free from outside influence. And yet there were many examples when intuition failed Hitler, did not help him to maintain a dominant position,
and insist on their own. For example, this happened once in my presence on March 12, 1945, when I again had to accompany Guderian to another working meeting with Hitler. It began, as usual, in the Imperial Chancellery at 4 p.m. sharp. After the reports of representatives of the land forces, air and naval forces on the situation in the West and East, all participants left the room, except for Bormann and Guderian, whom Hitler asked to stay. Guderian, in turn, detained in me, as I had with me all the documents on the Eastern Front. The Fuhrer was also waiting for General of the Panzer Forces Dietrich von Sacken, who had just been appointed by Hitler as commander of the Second Army fighting in the area of Danzig, Gidnia, and the Vistula Delta. The army was completely cut off from the rest of Germany, relied entirely on its own resources, and maintained a very tenuous link with the Fourth Army defending in East Prussia. In 1939, Zakhen participated in the Polish campaign, commanding a cavalry regiment. Later he changed from horse to tank and led one of the best tank units of the Wehrmacht. He fought on the Eastern Front, especially showed himself in January, February 1945, when he managed to lead his tank corps out of the encirclement, breaking through to the Oder near Steina, then crossed the river and joined the main German troops. He was awarded the Knight's Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords. We did not wait long. Soon Gensch, Hitler's adjutant, announced the arrival of von Sacken. We stood next to Hitler, who was sitting at a table with maps spread out, and then entered the tank general, slender, elegant, left hand rested carelessly on the hilt of a cavalry saber in the eye monocle. Greeting those present, he took a visor and then bowed his head slightly. Thus von Sacken committed three grave crimes at once. He greeted not in the Nazi way, as required by strict etiquette, that is, extending his arm up and saying, Heil Hitler. He did not surrender his weapon before entering the Fuhrer's office, and saluting, looked at him through a monocle. I looked alternately at Hitler and von Sacken, certain that something terrible was about to happen. Euderian and Bormann also stood still, as if petrified. But nothing happened, nothing at all. Hitler only asked Guderian to inform von Sacken about the military situation in East Prussia and in the area of Danzig, where the general was to take command of the Second Army. When Guderian finished, Hitler spoke. Correcting Guderian in some respects, he then outlined the main tasks facing the Second Army, which von Sacken will have to solve. Standing next to sitting at the table with Maps Hitler, von Sacken silently listened to him and Guderian. After a short pause, as if catching his breath, Hitler resumed the briefing and at the same time emphasized that during the army operations around and in Danzig, von Zocken competence extends only to issues directly related to the conduct of hostilities. The supreme authority belongs to the local Gauleiter Albert Frost, which is subordinate to the troops located on the territory under his authority. Hitler was silent and stared at von Zocken as if inviting him to express his opinion. Without the slightest embarrassment under his gaze, and without taking out his monocle, von Sacken with a determined look slammed his palm on the marble surface of the table and said, I am not going, Herr Hitler, to obey some Gauleiter. You could have heard a fly, fly, fly. It even seemed to me that from these words of the General Hitler, somehow shrank, slumped and even more hunched over. The first to break the prolonged silence, Guderian. Friendly tone called von Zocken to show understanding. He was joined by Bormann, but the general stubbornly repeated, I will not obey him. Guderian and Bormann did not know what else to say. Then came a repeated pause. It seemed never to end. But here, finally, Hitler spoke. Quietly, without any expression, he said, All right, von Zocken have it your way. After exchanging a few meaningless replica Hitler, without giving his hand, let the general go, and von Zocken, leaving, barely nodded. In the last weeks before the catastrophe, Hitler lost not only the former persistence in achieving their goals, but also the former determination and much of the mental energy. Perhaps he could not withstand, like many, terrible nervous tension,
or the regular use of medication. In any case, there were clear signs of not only physical, but also mental degradation. The head and the left side of the body began to shake more strongly. The left hand, and especially the palm, movements became less smooth and coordinated, increased slouching. When walking, Hitler already held the right hand left to hide the involuntary trembling. For the same purpose, when he sat, necessarily put his right foot on the left. His increased uncertainty in making decisions and his hesitations, which were not peculiar to him before, were conspicuous. In early March, for example, there was a need for the shortest way to transfer 22 tanks to help the German troops fighting in the Rhineland. Given the overwhelming superiority of the Allies in the air and the widespread destruction of rail transport, the delivery of combat vehicles to their destination required not hours but days. At first Hitler ordered to send tanks to the area of the city of Permisens. Then, with the sharp deterioration of the situation on the Moselle, he ordered to turn them to Trier. When it became clear that the tanks will not be able to arrive there in time, Hitler decided to send them to Koblenz. Then he changed the routes and destinations of the unfortunate tanks so many times that in the end, no one could no longer say for sure where they really are. As a result, these tanks never managed to get to the front line, and they, never having been in battle, freshly fallen into the hands of the Americans. Meanwhile, the Russians had already crossed the Oder and came close enough to Berlin. In connection with the emerging threat to the capital of Germany, the Fuhrer ordered to prepare the transfer of its headquarters somewhere in the central regions of the country. Part of the government and military command was to be located near the army training ground near Ordruf in Thuringia. However, the American motorized formations that crossed the Rhine near Darmstadt reached these places, command post Olga, much earlier than the German commanders. His new headquarters, codenamed Cyril, Hitler intended to arrange in Berchtesgaden, where it was supposed to urgently transfer some services of the Wehrmacht and intelligence apparatus, there also moved archival materials, accounting catalogs, and other clerical documents in the hope of preserving them until future, more favorable times. But when the Russians, having launched an offensive from the territory of Hungary, more and more deeply invaded Austria and Bohemia, when the news came about the fall of Vienna, and no one doubted that soon collapse of the front on the Oder, the last defensive line on the outskirts of Berlin, Hitler abandoned the plan to move to the Cyril and began to look for a suitable place for the command post in Schleswig-Holstein. Still, in the end, he remained with a small management team in Berlin, completely unprepared for the coming events, without proper communication with the troops and the various parts of the country, and without other means necessary for the sustainable leadership of public affairs. Advanced tank formations of the Americans by then had already appeared west of Magdeburg and in the vicinity of Dessau, and in meetings at the Fuhrer was still hotly debated whether to blow up the bridges over the Elbe, and especially the bridge of strategic importance, which passed an important highway. Hitler hesitated. Three times I passed the relevant order to the competent departments of the Supreme High Command of the Army, and twice I had to cancel them. Each time the entire long army chain of successive subordination was set in motion, down to the extreme link of the actual executors at the bridge. Toward the end, no one really knew what the Fuhrer's real orders were and how to act. Fierce battles raged in the east and west, in all directions, creating even more confusion. Bridges went up in flames, villages and towns went up in flames, turning into ruins and ashes. Everything that was not damaged by bombs was destroyed by hurricane artillery fire. Germany was being stripped of its priceless cultural heritage. But the thought of ending the senseless resistance, apparently, did not even arise in the mind of Adolf Hitler. We can illustrate the above with a vivid example. As the Americans approached Munster and Westphalia, Cardinal Galen came to meet them to negotiate the surrender of the city without a fight. Cardinal was an implacable opponent of Nessism and never hesitated to sharply and openly criticize the existing regime for its atrocities and cruelties and despite direct threats to his address. He only wanted to avoid wasting human lives and save the few cultural monuments from destruction.
The announcement of the surrender of Munster was contained in the report handed to Hitler in the reception room of the Imperial Chancellery as he greeted the audience. At that time, I stood a few steps away from him and saw his face contorted by a grimace of frenzied rage. Out of his rage, Hitler exclaimed, As soon as this pig falls into my hands, I will immediately order him to be strung up. The internal strife within the circle of Hitler's closest associates was still going on. In the midst of the battle on the borders of East Prussia, General Guderian issued an order concerning the training and use of newly created self-defense units, Volkssturm. Bormann saw this as interfering with his competence. A heated debate ensued, and Guderian had to concede. Soon the two men were again at odds, this time over the competence of the Nazi education commissioners assigned to each unit after the assassination attempt on the Fuhrer on July 20, 1944. They were something like the political commissars of the Red Army, instructed to monitor the morale of the soldiers, but in reality they monitored the officers. Some of these Nazi commissioners preferred to report through the head of the military command to Bormann personally, for example, about the defeatist sentiments among the officer corps of the army group fighting in Silesia. This accusation, unsupported by any solid evidence, was in addition in the report was greatly inflated as the very form of presentation and arbitrary generalizations. Of course, Bormann hurriedly passed this information to Hitler, who immediately asked Guderian on this occasion a real headache. After this catch-up, Guderian sent a letter to Bormann, in which he warned Bormann that he would not tolerate interference on his part in matters that do not concern him, and ordered to severely punish the commissioned officers who sent the report directly to Bormann, ignoring the established in the army order of passage of such papers. The fact is that this contingent of officers was directly subordinate to the army command, not to the party organs. Another scandal in which Guderian was involved, associated with SS General Fegelin, Himmler's permanent representative in the Führer's headquarters. Fegelin was known to be characterized by overly arrogant and rude treatment of senior meritorious Wehrmacht officers and statesmen. Although he was only 37 years old, he did not hesitate to unceremoniously interrupt any speaker, regardless of age and position, with his sometimes ridiculous remarks and remarks. Once in March 1945, at one of the regular meetings, Guderian described the situation in Pomerania. Suddenly, Fegeling interrupted him, saying that all the facts and figures mentioned are false, and presented in confirmation of the data available to him. Later it turned out that the information presented by Fegelin was absolutely untrue. The hero of the most striking of these personal struggles in the upper echelons of power in Germany should certainly be considered Hermann Göring, who at the end of the increasingly often made to feel that the Führer does not feel the same confidence in him. In recent weeks, Göring appeared in public in the uniform of the Air Force without orders and medals, probably believing that in the harsh conditions of warfare, it is more appropriate to dress more simply, temporarily putting aside the delicate blue franken of fine deerskin, red boots made of Russian leather, gold spurs, elaborate hat, and other exquisite accessories of outerwear, in which all used to see him. Apparently he was less and less interested in purely frontline problems. In the old days, when discussing the situation at the fronts, he used to lean low over the staff maps spread out on the table, blocking the view of the meeting participants standing behind him with his massive figure, interrupting the speakers, Guderian and Jodl. At half a word, he was in the habit, to support his point of view, led fat fingers on the map, although his remarks very often revealed a complete ignorance of military affairs. At one of the last meetings in the Führer's headquarters, the Reich Air Marshal, showing, as usual, bad manners, surpassed himself. We, all present, standing surrounded the table with staff maps spread out on it. Only Göring sat in a chair opposite Hitler. Listening to the speeches of the military, Göring with all his appearance showed that he was bored. He constantly yawned, and his face expressed genuine fatigue. In the end, he could not stand it, elbows on the table lid, and jammed his massive head into the massive head in a briefcase lying in front of him, made of green Moroccan leather.
It was as if Hitler did not notice him at all. It is very possible that Goring was actually asleep when Hitler quietly, in an almost soft voice, asked him to raise his elbows and allow him to change the map. At another meeting in the Imperial Chancellery, when General Christensen was reporting on the situation in the airspace, Hitler, stopping him half-heartedly, asked how many fighters of the latest design had already rolled off the factory assembly lines. Christensen tried to evade a direct answer, but from his words was already clear, not a single airplane has not yet taken to the air. For a moment, Hitler did not move and did not utter a word. But then his fists clenched convulsively, red spots ran across his pale face, and he, turning across the table to the Reichsmarschall, shouted in fury, There is no point in keeping your Luftwaffe, Goring, as an independent branch of the army. A furious profanity ensued. Hitler threatened to disband the Air Force, subordinate them to the leadership of the ground forces. Completely losing control of himself, Hitler in the presence of all of us, treating the Reichsmarschall as a schoolboy, yelled that he would demote Goring and the soldiers and send to the front as a private. When Hitler calmed down a little and subsided, Goring hurried to the reception area, where he hurriedly had a few shots of Cognac, and as was often the case when Hitler lost his temper, the participants of the meeting one by one tried to stealthily slip into the reception room, so that, God forbid, do not become the next object of the Fuhrer's outburst of anger. If in such a situation there was still a need to continue the discussion of other issues, adjutants and assistants again invited their superiors to the consultation room. Among other things, March 1945 was a month of acute personnel problems. It became difficult to find enough experienced military commanders capable of continuing the war under the most difficult conditions. At one of the working meetings, Guderian reminded Hitler of Field Marshal Erich von Manstein and proposed to use him again in the active army. As is known, Manstein conducted the most successful military operations in the southern sector of the Eastern Front, commanding the 11th Army, stormed Sevastopol. At one time, at the beginning of the war, as a member of the general staff, he participated in the development of almost all major military campaigns in the East, However, he made the inexcusable mistake, repeatedly pointing out to the Fuhrer his blunders in the preparation and implementation of important operations, especially on the Eastern Front. When Guderian again reminded of Manstein, Hitler responded by saying, If I had forty well-equipped divisions, capable of delivering a crushing blow to the enemy, the role of commander of this group of troops could only von Manstein. Of all the members of the general staff, he is perhaps the most talented. However, in the current situation, he is not suitable for me. Von Manstein does not believe in the ideas of National Socialism and therefore is not able to withstand the tension associated with the military situation in Germany in these days. Upon learning of the failure of the German offensive launched on March 6-7 in the area of Lake Balaton in Hungary and forgetting that the offensive was undertaken on his personal orders, Hitler again experienced one of his attacks of unbridled rage. The only reason for the failure he considered the lack of proper fanatical devotion to the great Germany in the commander of Army Group South, General Otto Wohler. Clenching his fists as usual, he shouted, Wohler has always had a negative and arrogant view of the ideals of National Socialism. He has not the slightest imagination and inspiration. Can one expect such a man to be determined and steadfast under difficult circumstances? Wohler was immediately removed from command. Another victim of the Fuhrer's extreme displeasure was Colonel von Bonen. His fall is connected with the collapse of the defenses on the Vistula as a result of the Russian offensive undertaken on January 12, 13 and 14, 1945. Before this, Hitler issued his famous order about fortresses which were required to defend under any circumstances, to the last man and the last drop of blood. And it should not be thought that in this case fortress meant well-fortified cities or defensive structures made of concrete and steel with extensive supplies of food and ammunition, powerful artillery and a large garrison, occupying convenient strategic positions, 
allowing to withstand for a long time a powerful onslaught of the enemy. On the contrary, giving the order, Hitler had in mind such defenseless towns and settlements, which he before the enemy offensive or already in the course of it arbitrarily classified as fortresses, based on his own subjective opinions about the importance of this or that frontier. With few exceptions, they had nothing in common with the traditional popular perceptions of fortresses and designated only the territories which, as the Fuhrer believed, had to be held at all costs. Hitler referred Warsaw to such a fortress, ordering the 5,000-strong garrison headed by a general to hold on to the last soldier. However, the garrison commander received the Fuhrer's order too late when the troops had already left the city on January 17, 1945. Hitler blamed von Bonin, chief of operations of the Supreme High Command of the Army, for the delay in transmitting the order, although there was no evidence of his guilt. As a result, von Bonin and his two assistants were arrested by the Gestapo and imprisoned first in a Berlin prison and then sent to a concentration camp. Somewhat later, when it came to selecting a suitable commandant for the fortress of Frankfurt, M. Oder Jodl, addressing Hitler, said, If you, my Fuhrer, need the best and most experienced commander, there is only one candidate for the position. I mean, of course, Colonel von Bonin. Hitler instantly exploded and irritably stated, A man who is not able to properly fulfill my orders, I do not need. From that moment the subject of Colonel von Bonin was finally closed and he remained in a concentration camp until the end of the war. Hitler was especially furious when he was informed of the failure or defeat of any of the Nazi Old Guard, although he never bothered to check the factual accuracy of the information or investigate the true reasons for the failure. On April 14, the 6th SS Panzer Army under Obergruppen für Josef Sepp Dietrich left Vienna. The general was a veteran of the Nazi party, leading the Führer's personal regiment, Liebstandart Adolf Hitler, until 1933. The 6th SS Panzer Army was at that time the most combat-ready and battle-hardened association, but upon learning that this army had retreated, surrendering Vienna, Hitler simply became furious and ordered to send Dietrich a radiogram of the following content. The Fuhrer believes that entrusted to you troops did not show themselves as required by the situation and ordered to deprive the armed patches of the personnel of the SS divisions, Adolf Hitler, Greater Germany, Dead Head, or Hohenstaufen. The patches on the sleeves of military uniforms had the same symbolic meaning. At least, so it was assumed, as cockades in the old army. Upon receiving the Fuhrer's telegram, Dietrich replied that he would rather put a bullet in his forehead than carry out this order. In February and March 1945, the situation in the West was as disastrous as in the East. American and British troops penetrated further and further into the depths of Germany, crossing the Rhine first at Remagen and then seizing bridgeheads elsewhere on the East Bank. They marched almost non-stop, not meeting serious resistance. At this critical moment, Hitler announced the formation of militia units, Werewolf, to conduct sabotage and subversive work in the rear of the advancing troops. The idea was widely publicized by Goebbels' propaganda apparatus. The Werewolf units and groups were created on the model of the Soviet and Polish partisan units, which operated in the German-occupied territories of Russia and Poland, from teenagers and elderly people who were not subject to conscription into the armed forces, practically on an empty place, and in an incredible hurry. Did Hitler really imagine that this desperate measure would somehow help to achieve a breakthrough, to change the situation, or at the very least, to postpone indefinitely the inevitable denouement? Did he think that the German people would willingly and uncomplainingly follow him into oblivion? Did he see himself as the main character in some Wagnerian opera, standing in tongues of flame on the vast stage called the Third Reich? Did he want to doom with himself and the entire German nation of the Thousand-Year Empire? Now it is impossible to say what thoughts were wandering at that moment in the mind of this man. Hitler had long ago lost all contact with his people, had no idea about them.
and the people were already dead tired of the war, which lasted almost six years, was exsanguinated, exhausted by continuous massive bombing, and did not want anything more than peace and quiet. Diversionary groups werewolf could be of some use if they were not prepared at the last moment and not at short notice, but in advanced training and establishing strongholds. In Russia and Ukraine, partisan methods of warfare were successful, among other things, because the German leadership did not have enough troops to reliably control the entire vast occupied territory. In France, Norway and Denmark, the underground resistance movements could function successfully for a long time only thanks to the support of the Allied states, which provided weapons and conducted an appropriate propaganda campaign abroad. Germany had nothing of the sort. It soon became apparent that the werewolf groups were unable to do anything against the rapidly advancing Anglo-American forces. By then, even the elite military units had already stopped obeying Hitler's orders. When the Americans surrounded in the Taunus Mountains transferred from Norway's 6th SS Mountain Division numbering 5,000 men, Hitler ordered the personnel to break into small groups and join the organization Werewolf, but the Fuhrer's order no one thought to carry out. And if in the West before the Werewolf tasked to at least somehow slow down the advance of the Allies, in the East, all means of propaganda out of the skin of their teeth to induce the local population to total resistance to the advancing Red Army. Eudarian made a similar appeal. Meanwhile, from the eastern German lands was an endless stream of desperate, exhausted civilian refugees, and this stream soon turned into a raging river. On both sides of the main roads leading westward, mountains of abandoned cars, wagons, and household goods were piled up, intermingled with the corpses of people and animals who had died of hunger and cold. Train after train arrived at Berlin's railroad stations packed with refugees. Many of those traveling in open wagons and on platforms froze on the way, buried under a thick layer of snow. It seemed that the very air was saturated with unbearable suffering and unspeakable grief. But Adolf Hitler did not see any of this or did not want to see, so that perhaps not to be deprived of the notorious inspiration. In the last years of the war, he rarely left his headquarters near Rastenburg in East Prussia, built among the magnificent green meadows, dense forests, and clear lakes. Reigning here peace and beauty seemed unreal against the background of the war raging everywhere in Europe with its cruelties and blood. And Hitler perceived the war as a changing set of numbers, blue and red lines on staff maps. He never once expressed a desire to see any documentary showing the true scale of destruction from massive bombing, which would help him to make at least a rough idea of the realities of the war. What could Hitler have known about the true agony of his people? His closest associates in the party and government tried their best to conceal from him troubles of any kind, so as not to destroy his fatal illusions for the country. And it is impossible to say whether they did so out of weakness of character, out of cowardice and fear of the Fuhrer, or because of lack of courage to honestly admit their own mistakes. Hitler once called Churchill a war idiot, but while Churchill was climbing over piles of bricks, destroyed London neighborhoods, inspiring grief-stricken people, visited soldiers in the trenches, smoking a cigar and waving a cane. Hitler was hiding in the wilds of East Prussia behind the backs of countless heavily armed guards, never once appeared near the front or among the civilian population affected by air raids of cities. Only once did he get a glimpse of the scale of destruction in Berlin. It happened in November 1944, when he left the Wolf's Lair near Rustenburg and took a special train to Bad Neuheim. Passing through the suburbs of Berlin, he was struck by the pictures of total devastation. According to Hitler, addressed to the persons accompanying him, he did not think that the consequences of bombing could be so damaging. In the meantime, he always found time for minor affairs and secondary occupations state affairs and problems of military strategy, on which sometimes depended the life or death of thousands of fellow citizens, were put aside if suddenly there was, for example, a question concerning the establishment of a new military medal. So in the last few days of March 1945, when the situation at the fronts seriously complicated, 
Hitler ordered to deliver him from the Enterprise's sketches of a new combat award. He could spend hours pondering over his fantastic projects for the reconstruction of Berlin and other German cities. Some might argue that such pastimes helped the Führer relax and unwind, and that Roosevelt was distracted by looking at his stamp collection. I don't dispute that this is true, but the idiots Churchill and Roosevelt had the good sense to leave matters of warfare to their generals. Hitler, however, considered himself both supreme ruler and commander-in-chief. At the same time, he had not yet allowed anyone to combine political activity with the leadership of military operations. Nevertheless, in early 1945, seeing the economic and military situation steadily deteriorating, Guderian considered it his duty to intervene in politics. On the evening of January 23, Envoy Dr. Barandin visited him to formally introduce himself as the new liaison official between the Imperial Foreign Ministry and the Chief of the Army General Staff. Already in his first visit Barandin heard from Guderian a truthful account of the reasons for the collapse of the Eastern Front with the Russian move on January 12 in a broad offensive. A frank account of a catastrophe on a scale comparable only to the collapse of the German armed forces in October 1918. In conclusion, Guderian demanded that the foreign ministry not delay to begin negotiations with the belligerent western states on an armistice. Already that same night, Barandin conveyed the contents of his conversation with Guderian to Reich Foreign Minister Ribbentrop, but this private initiative did not find a response in the offices of the Honorable Department. The leadership of the ministry was not ready to put before Hitler the question of concluding a temporary truce between the warring parties, not to mention a complete and unconditional surrender to the Western powers. Two days later, Guderian again appealed to this ministry, even more insistently demanding immediately without intermediaries and directly begin negotiations on an armistice with the Western allies. And again, to no avail. On the content of conversations between Guderian and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Hitler became aware of the same day from a memo from Ambassador Walter Huvel, the permanent representative of the ministry in the Führer's headquarters. At the regular working meeting held in the evening, Hitler sharply recalled his order No. 1, issued in 1939 before the outbreak of war, strictly forbidding anyone to pass on any information relating to the scope of his official work to representatives of the other ministry. Hitler then emphatically added, if the chief of the general staff informs members of the foreign office about the situation in the East in order to gain their support for the idea of an armistice, he thereby commits high treason. Later, Guderian repeatedly tried to intervene in political matters, hoping to persuade the leadership of the Third Reich to accept his proposal for an immediate armistice with the West. In mid-March 1945, Guderian learned from a neutral state's radio broadcast of a search for peace by a Dr. Hess in Stockholm. Again, Dr. Berandin acted as an intermediary between Guderian and the Foreign Office. But this time, too, nothing came out of the conversation in Wilhelmstrasse, to which I accompanied the Colonel General. As Guderian and Berandin finally realized, to seek an armistice, counting on the assistance of the Foreign Office, it made no sense, apparently at this stage of the war had to look for other approaches. In addition, as the war dragged on, especially in the East, the diplomats lost their influence on the Fuhrer and no longer enjoyed his former authority. This was particularly pronounced in Hitler's political will. Euderian still did not retreat, but now he was already trying to act through Himmler and Goring. The day after the unsuccessful campaign on Wilhelmstrasse, he went to Prenzlau, the headquarters of Army Group Vistula, which was commanded by Himmler, to persuade him to submit a letter of resignation from this position. Himmler, apparently, responded to Guderian's request with joy, probably because, first, correctly assessed his abilities as the commander of a powerful battle group, and secondly, because this way to gain the former freedom of action. He was replaced by Colonel General Heinrichsy, who had hitherto commanded the army in Slovakia. At this meeting in Prenzlau Guderian spoke with Himmler and the need for a quick truce. Shortly after this conversation, March 21, the two met again in the Imperial Chancellery. 
and Guderian literally begged Himmler to urgently pay attention to the problem. Agreeing with the arguments of the chief of the general staff, Himmler flatly refused to support him at the Fuhrer because, not without reason, feared that Hitler would order him to shoot him if he only dared to stammer about such a proposal. Again, Hitler learned of this conversation on the same day, and at an evening meeting on March 21, advised Guderian tone, allowing no objections, take a leave of absence and go to a good clinic to be treated in connection with the incessant complaints of the heart. Guderian, however, did not immediately follow the Fuhrer's advice, as his intended successor, General Krebs, has not yet recovered from the injury. Realizing that there is less and less time to maneuver, Guderian and Berandin decided to turn to Goring. To talk to him volunteered Himmler, familiar with the case. The conversation, which lasted more than four hours, took place in the Palace Kirin Hall, Goring's personal residence. Reichsmarshal of Aviation unconditionally recognized the urgent need for immediate negotiations on an armistice, but like others, categorically refused to even touch on this topic with Hitler. Göring also had no doubt that Hitler would simply drive him away or, for goodness sake, maybe even put him in prison. Thus, all the efforts of Guderian, despite the personal danger, as soon as possible to stop the bloody and ruinous for Germany's war, at least against the Western Allies, ended in vain. The end of his active participation in the fighting was approaching. By passing Kustrin from the north and south, the Russians during the winter offensive created a small bridgehead west of this city, on the opposite bank of the Oder, and on March 13 surrendered to the Russians and the city itself, declared the day before Hitler fortress, and defended by troops led by SS Lieutenant General Reinfart. At the insistence of the chief of the OKW 9th Panzer Army, under the command of General Buss, on March 23 and 24 attempted to eliminate the bridgehead, or at least restore communication with Kistrin. To accomplish this task at the disposal of General Buss were only the 20th and 25th motorized divisions. But since the Russians concentrated on the bridgehead, a huge number of troops and mainly artillery, and the German forces were not enough, it was not possible to achieve success. Because of the extremely dense artillery fire, both divisions suffered heavy losses. Euderian then allocated Bus an additional two divisions and ordered a renewed effort. On March 27, the 20th and 25th divisions together, with two SS divisions, Munchberg and Führer's Guard, again suddenly attacked the Soviet units defending the bridgehead and even advanced by three kilometers then the offensive collapsed due to heavy losses on our side. For the liquidation of the bridgehead and the liberation of Kistrin simply did not have enough forces. On the failure at Kistrin Guderian reported at noon on March 27, the commander of Army Group Vistula, Colonel General Heinritzi. I well remember how upset was Guderian, having received this message. He very much believed that we are still able to achieve at least local success. All soldiers and officers fought excellently, but what could they do if the enemy far outnumbered us? True to his principles, Huderian, without delay on the same day, informed Hitler of the situation with the bridgehead at the next meeting in the Imperial Chancellery. After hearing Guderian, the Führer became furious and lashed out at Bus and his soldiers with completely unfair reproaches and undeserved profanity. His reaction indicated a complete loss of any sense of the real. Ending tumultuously expressed his displeasure, Hitler ordered Guderian to appear before him on March 28 at 14.00 with General Buss for a detailed report on the progress of the battle. On the evening of March 27, Guderian sent Hitler a letter detailing the preparation and implementation of the Kistrin operation. He presented the Führer accurate data on the balance of forces of the advancing German units and the defending Soviet troops, mentioning our colossal losses in personnel and equipment. In conclusion, Guderian in sharp terms rejected as unfair Hitler's accusations against General Buss at the afternoon meeting. March 28, exactly at the appointed time Guderian and Buss arrived at the Imperial Chancellery, coldly greeted the generals, Hitler immediately invited Bus to report, 
But no sooner had he opened his mouth, as the Fuhrer pounced on him with reproaches of a purely personal nature, began to scold with the last words of all participants in the battle for the bridgehead, privates and officers equally. But here a loud, sonorous voice interrupted Hitler's angry tirade. Despite the understandable excitement, Guderian word for word repeated to the Fuhrer the same arguments that he had already given the previous day in a letter. He absolutely disagreed with Hitler's accusations concerning alleged errors in the preparation and conduct of the operation. Unable to refute the valid arguments of the Chief of General Staff, Hitler, sitting in his chair, increasingly noticeable slouching and pale, but then suddenly jumped out of his seat with such vivacity, which no one expected from him and did not expect. His face was covered with red spots, his left arm, and the whole left side of his body shook more violently than usual. It seemed that a little more, and he rushed with fists at Guderian. But Guderian stood still, as, indeed, and all who were at that moment in the office of the Fuhrer. For a few moments there was dead silence, only clearly could be heard excited, intermittent breathing of the two men. Then from Hitler's mouth came a stream of reproaches and curses, colored with fierce hatred. At the same time, he was no longer referring to the battle for the Kistrinsky bridgehead, and personally Guderian, led by him General Staff, and the officer corps of the Wehrmacht as a whole, blaming them for all the failures of recent months. And he contradicted himself in almost every word. Guderian, for his part, too, began, losing his composure, to come to a rage. He recalled his requests for additional help with people and equipment, which was groundlessly denied, the omissions of Hitler himself in strategic planning. Guderian spoke of unnecessary and doomed to failure in the Ardennes offensive, the refusal to save the German grouping in Courland and withdraw from their surrounded 23 divisions, the unwillingness to strengthen the front in the east at the expense of a significant weakening of the Western Front and concentrate enough troops before the breakthrough in the Lake Balaton area. He also touched on the bitter lot of the German population of the eastern German lands, abandoned, in fact, at the mercy of fate. The first to wake up from the stupor caused by this heated altercation, Major von Freytag Loringhofen, Guberian's aide, fearing that the general would immediately be arrested, he hurried to the reception room, called General Krebs, and describing the situation created in the Imperial Chancellery and its possible unpleasant consequences, began to beg Krebs to invite Guderian to the phone, ostensibly to give him an important message from the front. Meanwhile, General Tomel and another officer present tried to separate Guderian and Hitler, and the adjutant of the latter carefully but insistently seated the Fuhrer in his chair. Then Guderian went to the reception room to talk to Krebs, and returned to the deliberation room again fully in control of himself. Everyone pretended as if nothing extraordinary had happened. Hitler asked General Buss a few trivial questions, and the subject of the Keistern bridgehead was close. The meeting continued as usual, but in the room remained extremely tense and oppressive atmosphere. The speakers were brief and concise. Almost no one asked questions. Everyone wanted to leave the Imperial Chancellery as soon as possible. At the end of the meeting Hitler asked Kedel and Guderian to linger. Two days later, the retired Guderian, having handed over to his successor, General Krebs, left Zossen, as it turned out, forever. As soon as Hitler demanded that Guderian leave his post in army headquarters, Major von Freytag Loringhofen filed a report requesting that he be sent immediately in any capacity to the front. But General Krebs was able to persuade him to remain in Berlin as assistant chief of the army general staff. I continue to serve as before as adjutant, but now with General Krebs, and I again often had to accompany him to meetings in the Imperial Chancellery. Already two days after Guderian's resignation, on March 30, I had the opportunity, together with General Krebs, to attend another working meeting with the Fuhrer. Krebs' report was mainly devoted to the breakthrough not authorized by Hitler about a thousand soldiers and officers, led by SS Lieutenant General Reinfarth, 
and surrounded Fortress Kistrin. The Fuhrer accepted the message almost without objection, which was quite unusual and once again testified to the absolute unpredictability of his moods. But perhaps he still had fresh in his memory an unpleasant clash of two days ago, which arose during the discussion of the problems of the Kistrin bridgehead. The main speaker that day was General Heinrichsee, commander of Army Group Vistula, which included the 3rd Panzer Army and the 9th Panzer Army, that is, the troops that were to defend Berlin from the expected Russian offensive. General, who first met with Hitler face to face, seemed restrained and calm, but appearances were deceptive, because he was prepared at all costs to achieve their own and defend their own point of view. Concerning the urgent measures for the defense of the capital of the Third Reich, reporting on the situation in the band of Army Group Vistula, Heinrichsee pursued the main goal, to convince Hitler to deprive Frankfurt M. Oder of the status of a fortress. The general hoped in this way to free up two divisions, badly needed to strengthen the severely thin defensive line on the Oder. After calmly listening to well-founded arguments Heinrichsee, Hitler demanded from Krebs some maps and documents relating to the area around Frankfurt M. Oder. I quickly found among the pile of papers I had brought with me what I needed and handed it to the Fuhrer, who silently began to look through them. Although Hitler often used glasses, all documents intended for him were typed on a specially made typewriter with a particularly large font. Then, rather suddenly, leaning on the armrests of the chair, Hitler stood up and began to loudly and hysterically quote the most important passages from the well-known to all his own order on fortresses. He shouted that neither the general staff, nor the generals and none of the officers never understood, and did not want to understand the content and meaning of the order, either out of cowardice or because of lack of proper devotion to the ideas of National Socialism. The outburst of indignation ended as suddenly as it began, and Hitler, completely exhausted, sank into a chair. Even today I can clearly see before me the stunned face of Heinrichsee, with an expression of extreme bewilderment. As if struck by lightning, he transferred his questioning gaze alternately from one participant in the meeting to another. But none of the military leaders, selected personally by Hitler and constantly in his vicinity, was not ready to side with Heinrichsee against the Fuhrer. And the general continued to stubbornly defend his point of view in proud solitude. Somewhat later, the subject of fortress came up again when discussing the candidacy for the post of commandant of Frankfurt M. Oder. Hitler wanted someone in the spirit of Neisena, a German commander, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Heinrichsee proposed Colonel Bieler, whom he considered sober-minded executive officer with a deep sense of duty and a great experience in combat operations. When a few days later it became clear that Hitler, despite the urgent requests Heinrichsee, does not want to see Bieler as commandant of the Frankfurt Fortress, and that no, one from the general staff does not support the proposal of the commander of Army Group Vistula. Heinrichsee submitted a letter of resignation. After that Hitler, without giving reasons, changed his position and agreed to the candidacy proposed by Heinrichsee. The general public knows little about some of the most influential people in Hitler's inner circle, and if about Himmler and Goebbels written quite enough, then about Reichsleiter Martin Bormann, there is only very little information. It is known, for example, that among the leading members of the NSDAP he was known as the most fierce anti-clerical and atheist. Martin Bormann was born in 1900, a front man of the First World War, after the surrender of Germany graduated from agronomy courses and worked in a large estate in Mecklenburg, actively participated in the work of the Nazi party, belonged to its leadership. With Hitler's rise to power, he was appointed chief of staff of the deputy Führer for the party Hess. Realized the connection between the NSDAP and Hitler, sparing no effort to consolidate their own power. The first thing Bormann tried to eliminate the influence of Hess on Hitler. He managed to step by step to distance them from each other, up to complete and final alienation. Undoubtedly, Bormann was an excellent psychologist and a great connoisseur of human nature. He quickly recognized Hitler's weaknesses and perfectly learned to use them to his advantage.
Providing small personal services, Bormann managed to get into the confidence of Hitler. Deftly picking up Hitler's ideas and thoughts, he quickly gave them the form of clear, well-formulated orders, which did not hesitate to submit for the signature of the Fuhrer. Such diligence could not fail to impress Hitler. Stealthily, subconsciously strengthening his opinion of his own abilities as leader of the National Socialist Movement. As a result, Bormann was finally appointed personal secretary to the Fuhrer by special order of Hitler in April 1942. Bormann also endeavored in every possible way, showing exaggerated admiration for the Fuhrer's wisdom to support and strengthen Hitler's fanatical belief in his own infallibility and divine genius. After Hess secretly left for Britain on May 10, 1941, no one could prevent Bormann from realizing his ambitious plans to become Hitler's closest advisor and confidant. As Reichsleiter, Deputy Führer, he also headed the party and imperial chancellery. Anyone who wanted to meet personally with Hitler, or to give him something, could do so only after first obtaining the consent of Bormann. And this applied not only to party, but also to important state affairs. All papers had to first pass through Bormann's hands before they would be seen by Hitler. Bormann's ambition extended so far that he denied access to the Fuhrer in advance to anyone who refused to carry out his orders. It is very possible that he intended to one day seize supreme power in Germany. This would make perfect sense, given his inherent ambition. He was hated by all who dealt and worked with him. His attitude toward people can be judged by the resolution he imposed on the document of one high-ranking SS leader. Bormann, in particular, wrote in the margin, I do not socialize with idiots. Among Hitler's associates he had no friends, he was respected and feared. In some ways quite similar to Bormann was, and Gauleiter Erich Koch also often had access to Hitler. More massive than Bormann, but with even more rough and fierce facial features, he was not inferior to the Reichsleiter in ambition, egoism, and arrogance. While in the midst of the war on a visit to Göring, in his fabulous residence Kerenhall, Koch boasted to his host that by the fall hunting season, which was only a few months away, he will build an even more beautiful hunting house. And so, in a tense period when the Allied Air Force turned into piles of rubble one German city after another, Koch turned his castle Buchen off near Zichenau into a luxurious palace, spending several million marks on the rebuilding. Finding German marble insufficiently beautiful, he spent expensive currency to have marble shipped from Sweden. When the German troops retreating from the east passed through Zichina, he did not allow a hospital for wounded soldiers in his palace. Estate after estate passed into his possession. Appointed Reich Commissioner of the Ukraine in 1942, Koch persuaded Hitler to subordinate the Bialystok region to him so that he could claim that his possessions extended from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. And in the critical situation, when the Russians captured Königsberg in April 1945, when the encircled Third and Fourth Armies fought a desperate but hopeless battle in East Prussia, and thousands of German refugees waited in vain for transportation to reach the western lands of Germany, Koch quietly, as if nothing was happening in the territory under his jurisdiction, was hanging around at Hitler's meetings. In April 1945, Koch tried to sneak out of the Imperial Chancellery to hide somewhere. To do so, he changed his Nazi uniform for a windbreaker, apparently rightly believing that if the Berliners recognized him on the street, they would deal with him without ceremony. But Hitler did not order him to hang for this, like thousands of soldiers and officers who saved their lives in really hopeless situations. It's just that Koch was never seen again after this episode. Otto Karl Sohr, head of the technical department of the Imperial Ministry of Armaments and Munitions, can be considered another typical representative of the party top brass. Together with Minister Albert Speer, he was responsible for providing the German armed forces with all kinds of military equipment. Already because of his elephant-like figure intriguer and deceiver, Sor had to fall into a select group of people whose blind obedience and complete indiscretion in the means of achieving the goal always so impressed Hitler. Zor, too, had an unquenchable thirst for power. The following episode, 
which I witnessed personally, characterizes this man quite vividly. During the fierce fighting in Hungary in March 1945, the German troops of Army Group South had an urgent need for small arms. At that moment, more than 20,000 rifles were left in the warehouse of a large arms factory in Slovakia, which was already being approached by the Red Army. Upon learning of this, Hitler passed the information to Speer, obliging him to send rifles to Army Group South without delay. When Speer began to express doubts about the possible practical realization of the transaction, Hitler summoned to himself Zor. Showing up, Zor youthfully clicked his heels and strung, as his proper, hand in the Nazi salute, dashingly barked, Heil, my Fuhrer, and thus made the right impression on Hitler. Upon learning what was going on, Zor enthusiastically accepted the assignment and promised to deliver the rifles to their destination within 48 hours. The problem was thus solved, and Hitler was satisfied. But the troops never received the weapons, which never left the company's warehouse at all. It was after this meeting with Sor that the Führer appointed him as Speer's successor in his will.